Who doesn't love new records? Who doesn't love new music? Mazzy here. And I'm gonna show you some new releases, uh, a couple of reissues and then new releases, uh, and some records that were sent to me free, and a lot, most of these I purchased myself. There is a segment of vinyl buyers these days, and they tend to be older in my demographic that just don't believe or don't seem to want to go to buy uh, new music. They just want to kind of get the same old things, and that's fine, you know. Uh, I have a lot of friends my age who are not really record collectors that stopped at a certain point of uh, checking out new music and think there's nothing good. Now, of course, you know, the 60s, the 70s were uh, a golden era. The 80s was a golden era of record making. And, and every decade has some great music. And a lot of people fall off or move on to something else. Maybe they get a family, they move on, and all they want to listen to is, is to their uh, Billy Joel and Phil Collins records and, and Beatle records and Rolling Stones records and Who records and jazz reissues over jazz reissues and jazz reissues but uh i have a pile of new music some new artists a lot of old artists so but so anyway i definitely um when i'm doing these videos contradict myself and i know i'm going to contradict myself here but that's the fun of it we're here to have a good time and i want to talk about the music uh first i want to start of uh two of four upcoming uh, reissues by the band R.E.M. Uh, I posted these records on Instagram and I said, problem children or hidden gems. Obviously we have here Collapse, uh, R.E.M.'s final record. And then they, you know, to their credit, I, they, they felt the momentum wasn't there, the artistic achievement wasn't there, they called it quits and also Around the Sun. Now, I have been all in on R.E.M. from the beginning. I came in on the ground floor with uh, uh, Gardening at Night, I guess was the first song. I probably saw them six times from small clubs to medium venues. I don't think I, I never saw them in a large stadium type uh, setting. And then I've seen offshoot bands of uh, the, the Baseball Project with Mike Mills and Peter Buck and the others. Uh, Steve Wynn and some other kind of offshoot things. So I'm all in. I bought all the CDs as they came out. But for, for right now, I want to just showcase these records. Uh, I think these records, I've always enjoyed the CDs. Yes, you don't have the, the maybe the standout tracks, the song writing got a lot, a little bit muddied uh, during this period. Uh, they're also going to be putting out uh, Reveal and Accelerate, I believe, uh, end of August. And I will be all in on these. And I uh, I listened to this one uh, twice now since I got the vinyl version. You know, when you have a vinyl, if those of you who are into vinyl and maybe came from the CD period, maybe stepped out on vinyl, cheated on your vinyl collection and went all in on CDs, which I did for about 15 years as well. You know, that, that CD period, some of these records just were too goddamn long, right? and you kind of lost interest, you weren't paying attention, but when you put on a record, I think, at least for me, I pay attention more, and I really, really enjoyed this, and uh, some, there was, you know, the beautiful sort of, what Michael Stipe and R.E.M. would consider a ballad, a beautiful with acoustic guitars, with Oh My Heart, but um, I really like this record, and this record, uh, this is on a, a double uh, LP vinyl experience, with a lot of blurred, uh, beautiful imagery. Um, Co-produced by R.E.M. and Pat McCarthy. I enjoyed this as well, High Speed Train. I love that song. Uh, Wonderlust as well, and Leaving New York. But I like this. Uh, is there some filler? Yes, uh, but I wanna get into it a little more, um, so I will dive into this. So those are the reissues. And now for some new music. Now, uh, this next record is local Seattle band, Mud Honey and this is Plastic Eternity, uh, their new offering. I really love this album. To me, this is sort of punk psychedelic a la Iggy and the Stooges. If you like the, uh, you know, the first few, the Iggy and the Stooges classic records, I think this is right in there. 
being in Seattle, I've really in the last, what, nine years I've been here now, try to dump in, <laughs> dump in Freudian slip there, jump in more on the grunge scene. And I'm not, I just don't like that, you know, that kind of uh, singing of the, of the Pearl Jams and the Sound Gardens and the Chris Cornells and the Eddie Vedder. Although I appreciate those bands and to me, like a band like Pearl Jam and Soundgarden to some extent, obviously we know the history. I'm not going to get into those things. Uh, they're almost like sports teams here in Seattle. They're like, oh my God, Pearl Jam is basically almost more important than the Seattle Seahawks, especially definitely more important than the, Mar the Mariners, the baseball team. But And that's great. I love that sort of allegiance and that pride of the band. But I like uh, Mud Honey better. And I be honest, I have like three of their albums and I didn't follow them over the years. I did get some of their earlier albums, uh, came out of the Green River, that whole thing. And I like it because the vocals are a lot better than those grunge bands for me and the music. I like the punkness of it. And this band, there's a little more punk psychedelic, as I said, like, uh, like if you again, if you like Iggy and the Stooges, uh, the, their first two albums, uh, I think this is an album you'll love. It sounds great too. And it just, I mean, there's, um, some great, obviously great guitar playing, great vocals, just great rock and roll, really. And it's, uh, I think, a really uh, wonderful record. Uh, played it a couple times, enjoy Mud Honey. Now, this is a total departure and a total surprise for me. I pontificate a lot on British folk music, the, the UK folk rock scene of the late 60s. and But the whole folk revival scene in the early to mid 60s, there was an artist that um, I really like, uh, Shirley Collins, and Shirley Collins did the great collaboration with Davy Graham, guitar player, folk singer. Uh, I love that music. And I was gobsmacked when I saw this record, and I was thinking, what is this, a reissue? Shirley Collins, Archangel Hill, kind of a thematic uh, record. And this is her coming back, doing new music. She's. God, I, she must be close to 80 or, you know, 80-ish. Her voice is lower. It's a little more uh, tentative, but interesting and good. And this is a beautiful record. Uh, if you like uh, Shirley Collins, uh, it's just a lovely record. Very poetic, obviously, that, you know, an amazing folk singer, an important artist of the British uh, folk revival, British early 60s, mid 60s folk scene that influenced so many of the UK artists and American folk artists. Uh, but um, it's it's on uh, Domino Records and it is a joy to behold. Uh, this copy is on beautiful green vinyl, very, very English, Irish, obviously. I shouldn't probably merge those together, but um, it, it it, it's acoustic. It's exactly what you would expect it to be musically, uh, very organic, uh, but a, a, obviously a different voice. And she went through a number of years where she literally couldn't sing. And uh, so having having new music from Shirley Collins, really beautiful, um, just sublime from my taste, from my point of view. Now, another record uh, that I've been really excited about I love the last, what, three, four years, this great reissue uh, series of PJ Harvey. And this is, I think, definitely gonna be in my top uh, records of 2023 here. I love, this is just a little thing that I noticed that I haven't seen anyone else pointed out, but look at the way the typeface is. Let me show that with the right light. Can you see that? There we go. What does that remind you of? SWB0101, which is the American catalog number for the Beatles' White Album, or actually titled The Beatles, uh, nicknamed the White Album. I like that she kind of uses that type font, that little shadow, but it's not embossed or, uh, here, like on the original uh, Beatles album. Uh, but it's kind of fun. This is a moody, poetic record. I would say this is the lowest key, not in terms of, ah, uh, like that kind of key. But it is a minimal record. It is, she does though get into high register of vocals on some of the tracks, which is very different and unique, at least from what I know about PJ Harvey. And I have a lot of her records. I have probably all her records. 
Um, England Shakes is one of my favorite, which is more upbeat and in your face and, and modern and post-punkish. But this is kind of, this would be in a way, I'd compare it to like Nick Cave's Ghost Teen. Obviously there's that connection past romantic and musical a collab collaboration uh, with Nick Cave. Uh, but it's not like as, as ethereal as uh, Ghost Teen, but it, it, it is a like that. And it's just a really, uh, really wonderful record. And uh, this is a record for me, at least, I want to put on almost every morning. I think, if, what am I going to put on? I, you know, this is something I gravitate to quite a bit, but I can't give it preference because I have so many new records coming in. Another artist, but on a, uh, the other side of the spectrum, and this is Joey Yall, Jenny Lewis. Love Jenny Lewis. She's like a pop ingenue, a pop country, quirky lyrics, wonderful songwriting. She has some of the best hooks in pop music now. And uh, this is the first album since she left LA, that whole scene in Los Angeles, uh, moved to Nashville. I, f I can totally see her becoming one of those songwriters where other artists will gravitate to some of these songs and maybe have bigger hits than she has. Uh, you know, she's never had a huge hit, obviously. Um, just, I love her voice. She's got a beautiful voice, a little dry wit, and her wordplay is really interesting. Uh, this has a total retro sound. This is a very retro, early 70s record. Singer, songwriter, uh, pop, so it's not like the Carol Kings or the uh, James Taylors or that, you know, California singer, songwriter, but it has a lot of influences, obviously, with the cover art that has that kind of retro look to it. It reminds me of that Dan Auerbach album that, that he did, that solo album that has kind of this type of uh, early 70s retro cover design and musically sounds like an album from the 70s. Um, you know, several artists have over the last few years have, have done this sort of uh, harking back to 70s production, 70s songwriting, all the cards that relate to the songs. But again, a beautiful record. Uh, on Blue Note Records, Blue Note really doing a pop record. Of course, Nora Jones crosses over uh, with that art. Um, obviously, Nora Jones has a more jazzier side. This is not jazzy at all, but it's really well produced, has a great sound to it. All the lyrics, it's a, it's a fun song. There's a song here called Love Feel uh, that does one of those, uh, lists everything like Billy Joel does with the, you know, we haven't stopped the fire and a certain uh, artist that will name drop. Uh, Dylan's done it uh, in his last album, Murder Gone Foul. Not in the same type of thing, but her, you know, there is a, 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 a 70s white soul to this album as well. White soul, white folk rock. Well, is there anything else? I don't know. Uh, folk rock, pop, folk pop rock, uh, the LA, the, the Laurel Canyon sound a little bit. Uh, Joey Y'all, collect them all. Joey Y'all, fantastic album, quirky as hell, and totally the opposite of the PJ Harvey. Uh, this is not a serious album. This is, this is a fun, friggin' fun summer album. This is the summer album of 2023 for me. Summer album, there you go. Another new album. Now, this is something more serious, obviously. And this is um, Anoni and the Johnsons. Obviously, uh, formerly Anthony and the Johnsons. Uh, this cover picture might be jarring to some people, which is unfortunate because uh, this is a political statement and this is a dedication of an album. And this is Marth, a photograph of uh, Martha P. Johnson, who was a yeah, civil rights. She was a leader in the LBG community at a New York part of the Stonewall riots of 1969, uh, died trag tragically um, many, many years ago. And uh, Anthony and the Johnsons, the name Johnson literally is influenced and inspired by, by um, her, her, life, her plight, um, her how she stood up for things. This is uh, this record is produced by Anoni and uh, Jimmy Hogarth, who worked um, with a lot of British, uh, British, uh, you know, soul artists. There's a soulness to this um, record. Amy Winehouse, he worked on. That's who I was thinking of. Um, so there's a soul to this. This is, album was very much influenced uh, by Nina Simone, 
So it's got a little of that. Doesn't sound anything like Nina Simone, but Nina Simone had a quiet political side to her music and a very in-your-face political side uh, in terms of Nia, Nina Simone's music. Little Jimmy Scott, uh, the jazz singer, also it, very it, it was on their minds when they recorded this uh, this record. I think one song gets a little louder guitar-wise, which I really like it because it's not a passive album. But it is a quiet album musically, um, you know, very, I mean, political, I mean, sexual politics and, uh, you know, queer politics, uh, just, but probably the most beautiful album of the year, definitely. Uh, all the lyrics are here, you know, political scapegoat, there wasn't enough, you be free, it's my fault. Originally, I got into Antony and the Johnsons, I think on a tribute uh, to Leonard Cohen, beautiful beautiful uh, vocal, very unique singer, obviously collaborated with uh, Rufus Wainwright, um, a lot of artists, uh, Coco Rossi uh, is an artist, a two-sister group that I'm really into, and, and they've uh, collaborated there as well. I, I'm just going to briefly show this because I showed this in my It's the Music Stupid video, but uh, Anoni plays on, sings on one song with Rufus Wainwright. This is not a new record, but it was new to me. This came out 2020. Uh, early on in the pandemic, and I think it got lost. This reminded me of Harry Nielsen somewhat. His great operatic voice, but it's a pop album. This also is one of my favorite albums right now, uh, even though it's three years old. His new album is amongst my favorite of the year, Folkocracy. And this is called Unfollow the Rules, co-produced with Mitchell Froom. And a, this is a beautiful record. This is... Uh, Big production and great hooks and great melodies and um, a very unique record. It's it's hard to peg uh, a genre for this because it's pop music, but it's got more production. Even like when Nielsen used to get some overproduced for some people, but I think it's really, really a lovely record. So uh, watch that. It's the Music Stupid video. I get more into that record. Next is the new album by Youssef slash Cat Stevens. Interesting he's been using his uh, old name again, which I think is good. I mean, obviously it works commercially. This is his debut album on Dark Horse Records, uh, the Harrison Family Records distributed by BMG as well. And this is a beautiful record. The last few records have had this uh, you know, almost like it's children's storybook time. And that's not a bad thing. His songs are beautiful, are personal, they're upbeat, they're light, but his voice is as strong as ever. This is co-produced with Paul Samuel Smith, who produced those great classics in the 70s, Teaser and the Firecat, um, you know, Wild World, all those great songs were co-produced with him. And it's got that great acoustic sounds. Maybe two or three songs are upbeat, full band things, but his voice is up front. His guitar playing and recording is just really beautiful. It's got a, a lovely uh, book in it. His last few records have these almost like storybooks that follows uh, each lyric and each, each song in the book. Next is Ricky Lee Jones' Pieces of Treasure. Uh, this is her second covers record. I believe, what, 15, 20 years ago, she did a covers record. I think that was when she was still on Reprise Records. I believe Warner's, not sure. Uh, but this is a different one, produced by Russ Teitelman, who ironically, maybe not so ironic, but was the um, a &R and one of the great in-house producers at Warner Brothers for years, and happens to be the brother-in-law of Ry Cooter, his sister, uh, Susan Teitelman, photographer, is married to Ry Cooter. Uh, she does some great, more traditional, uh, wonderful cover th songs like Nature Boy, obviously made famous by Nat Cole, All the Way. And Sep September Song on here is just a really lovely uh, take on that. That's one of those songs that I love almost every version of it. I remember, what, 20 plus years ago, there was a, a, uh, a wonderful covers of a vintage album of uh, Brian Ferry covering that. Love his version. Of course, Brian Ferry on his solo records. Pretty much covers songs on every record. Uh, but um, you can't take that away from me. Uh, this is a lovely record. There's a Russ Titleman and uh, Ricky Lee Jones. Recorded in 2022. This came out last year. Three other records that were sent to me by BMG. And I want to thank Arnaldo again. And this is one I missed too. Again, during the pandemic, if you weren't paying attention, a lot of records sort of came and went. 
This is angel headed hipster. This is the, what, the fifth or sixth in a amazing uh, series of records Hal Wilner uh, produced. Hal Wilner died uh, from COVID uh, during the pandemic. Unfortunately, he was a music director at Saturday Night Live for many, many years. He put out these great sort of tribute records. One to Nita Roto, Nina Roto, who uh, did a lot of the Fellini film soundtracks with different people like Paul Carla Bly in that. Uh, he's done things uh, on Thelonious Monk collaborations. Tom Waits has been in his uh, collaborations. Lou Reed has been, Laurie Anderson. Hal Wilner did another collaboration of the music of uh, Disney, Walt Disney songs from the uh, motion pictures over the years to great success. Uh, and this is one I had not known about. This is the songs of Mark Bolin and T-Rex. You get Keisha doing Children of the Revolution, Nick Cave, there's a really ethereal, lovely version of Cosmic Dancer. Jeepster by Joan Jett. Uh, scenes off Devanda Van Hart, Life's a Gas by Lucinda Williams. Uh, Hippie Gumbo, Beth Orton really nails that one. Gabby Moreno, uh, Beltane Walk. I was surprised that I really like the version on here of Bang A Gong, Get It On. And it's as cliche as it sounds, it's you 2 with Elton John, and it's a really, really a good version. A lot of other uh, artists on here, Father John Misty, Perry Farrell, Gavin Friday, Nana, Muff Balloons, uh, she does Metal Guru. You got Mark Allman, Todd Rundgren. Mambo's Son is a kind of a really faithful version, maybe too faithful, but it's a nice version by Sean Lennon and Charlotte Kemp Mule. Uh, that's, uh, they've collaborated with the ghost uh, the Sabretooth Tiger, that's uh, Sean's girlfriend, musician in her own right, has her own band as well. And a really interesting, strange version of Pilgrim's Tale with Victoria Williams and Julian Lennon. Of course, uh, David Johansson is on here doing a reprise version of Bang a Gong. But uh, if you're a fan of Mark Boland's uh, songwriting and you like the, the series that Hal Wilmer's produced over the last so many years, this is a worthwhile double album. And uh, I just finally got it and I missed it during the pandemic. So um, thank you for that, BMG. I've always been a big fan of um, Dr. John, Mac Rebeneck. I've seen him maybe five times over the years from his New Orleans styling to collaborating with other artists. What a great piano player. Again, we lost him in the last several years as well. Uh, I've seen him do, do solo work. And what's great about this, and my, my late buddy Larry would have been all over this record because I think uh, Dr. John was his favorite artist. I have all his, all his proper albums, I think, uh, between uh, vinyl and compact disc. And this is The Montreux Years, Dr. John, The Montreux Years. And so this covers live performances, The Montreux uh, Festival, The Montreux Jazz Festival. And it goes from, I think, 1986 all the way up to 2012 and in between, 95, uh, 95, 2004, 2007. And it's really well recorded, great live performances, some solo, some with bands. Uh, obviously, his New Orleans style of piano playing, which is uh, no one else really plays like, like him. Maybe, you know, even Professor Longhair, which had the, the roots of all this stuff, I think he takes it to another level, of course, his great soulful uh, songwriting, his soul, soulful soulful vocals. And, um, you know, he does cover some classics like Accentuate the Positive, Staggily, and uh, Professor Longhair Boogie, which is kind of this boogie jam thing on here, uh, making Whoopi as well. You know, he's had some great uh, cover albums as well over the years, but I just love the New Orleans style piano playing of uh, Mac Rebeneck, Dr. John. And uh, this is on BMG. And this is a fantastic Montreux uh, imprint on BMG of live. Great comp double album of some of the best live unreleased stuff. And lastly, in this little uh, segment, Graham Nash now. Now, I haven't really followed Graham Nash in years. Obviously, the, I'm the generation all in early on the Hollies and Crubby Seals Nash. And his first album... His first solo album with Military Madness is, to me, a, a perfect album. 
all three of these guys, when they came out of CSN, did a great debut solo album. Graham Nash, uh, If I Can Only Remember My Name by David Crosby, and of course the first Steve Stills record with uh, Love the One You're With. Every, all three of those records, uh, Songs for Beginners was the one he did, um, are perfect records. Now this record I listened to only once, and I enjoyed it, I didn't love it. This is an example of, am I too old for old people doing new music? Um, because someone like, you know, you take a Dylan, you take a Leonard Cohen, you know, they were kind of really innovative uh, as they got older in the, in the twilight years of their record making. And Dylan still, to me, uh, just reinvents himself in, in a way, not trying to reinvent himself to have a hit, but just he does what he wants to do. This is a really beautiful, well-recorded record. I think it's an easy record. It might be too easy for me. It's an old person's record. I am an old person, but I like something with a little more bite. But then again, you can't expect Graham Nash to all of a sudden try to do something to please. Who's he gonna please? This is probably perfect for the Graham Nash audience. I will say the same of uh, the last several uh, David Crosby records they did. Uh, BMG and Arnaldo did send me a, uh, I think the last uh, David Crosby record. I like some of it. One song in particular, I don't have it here, that I think, God, that reminds me of Steely Dan. And sure enough, it was written by uh, Donald Fagan. And it sounds exactly like a slower Steely Dan later period album. I'm not sure about this. It is a good record. It's what you would expect, no surprises. Um, is it my thing right now with all the great music I own and have? I'm not quite sure. Maybe not. Um, but I, I will put it on it while I'm, you know, cleaning the house and see how, uh, how it, if it creeps up on me. And I'm going to end with something a little different, a little esoteric. Uh, Arthur Russell picture of Bunny Rabbit. Uh, this just came out. This is a comp of unreleased music from 1985 and 86. Uh, he is an artist who died of AIDS also, I believe, in the 90s. Arthur Russell plays piano, he plays cello, guitar, harmonica, and does some vocalizing. And um, I knew of his name because of he was, I, I believe, uh, the curator or creative director of The Kitchen. And The Kitchen was uh, founded originally in the early 1970s in New York City. And I think originally Chelsea, then it moved to Soho. And... I, it, there, it was a, it's a performance space in New York and it still exists. And it came about as a performance state, space to do off kilter artwork, uh, video art, uh, music art, performance art, conceptual art. Uh, I visited it twice at two different locations, one in Soho, one in um, Chelsea. I think it's in Chelsea now. And this is a really interesting, this is minimalism of neoclassical experimental uh, tape recording, but it's, re it's an easy listen, but you know, it goes into the direction, a little bit of Kronos Quartet, but maybe more adventurous, although Kronos Quartet can be very uh, adventurous. It's not quite in the realm of Laurie Anderson. It's really beautiful. Sometimes they're vocal, uh, echo, repeating loop type things on here. And this is comp uh, put together of various recordings unreleased from 85 and 86 at a, from New York City. Um, this to me was a surprise. I saw several people on, I think it was maybe Dom, uh, talk about this, Dom from uh, Seeking a Thread, maybe someone else as well. But um, I just think this is a really beautiful record and again, Great reissues coming out, great new music coming out, uh, new bands, old bands, uh, just love it. It's a good time, for, uh, good time for record buyers. You don't always have to buy the sixth copy of, well, you decide, you fill in the blank. Thanks for watching. New music, new records out in the house here. Um, Mazzy loves you, and I appreciate you uh, taking the time to watch.